All authority has been given to me, in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How important is it that we carefully examine our religious beliefs in light of God's Word? Hello, my name is Cliff Goodwin and I welcome you here today for preaching the gospel. You know, some would reply perhaps, well, it's not important at all. As long as a person is religious, as long as a person is devoted toward God, then really the ins or outs of his or her beliefs they don't really matter. But you know, is that what the Bible teaches? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, the Apostle Paul instructs us accordingly. He wrote, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. As we ponder the sentiments in these two verses, we're impressed with the fact that Hey, there's something that matters. There is a responsibility on our part. There is a due diligence that is required of us. We are told to prove, to test all things, and having tested all things, thereafter to hold fast to that which is good. Naturally, holding fast that which is good implies also verse 22, and that is abstaining from all forms of of evil. The King James Version reads appearance, but that can be somewhat misleading. Jesus Himself told us to judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment, John 7 and verse 24. Actually that word in 1 Thessalonians 5.22 is the word form, and I believe the American Standard Version renders it as such. Paul's point was this, we need to prove all things. We need to put all things to the test, especially all things religiously and all things with regard to morality. And having put these things to the test, we ever need to hold fast and to retain that which is good, but that which has been tested and has been found to be a form of evil, we need to abstain from it. We need to stay away from it entirely. Now, friends and viewers, we've gone over these things from 1 Thessalonians 5 in order to lay the groundwork, if you will, for today's study. Today's study is going to concern a religious doctrine that is quite popular. It's quite well known in our nation and really throughout many parts of the world. It's commonly referred to as once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved. In some more technical circles, it might be referred to as the impossibility of apostasy. Now many of you I know are already familiar with this doctrine. It basically teaches that once a person is saved, once a person is converted to Christ and saved by the grace of God, that he or she thereafter can never fall from grace. It is actually impossible, according to this doctrine, for a person to backslide or to apostatize in such a way as to lose his or her salvation. Now obviously we can see how this doctrine would be received very popularly. It would allow for people to come to Jesus Christ supposedly and then thereafter, the logical conclusion is, thereafter they might live seemingly any way they desire. After all, it is once saved, always saved. That is the logical conclusion of that doctrine. But you know what? We need to prove all things. 
We need to go to God's Word and we need to weigh not only this doctrine but any and every doctrine with which we encounter and we need to see if it's true. Now we're going to use today a framework or a, an outline that I recently was able to hear presented by Brother Wade Webster, a faithful preacher of the gospel. And we're going to consider it from the book of 2 Peter. I want you to take your Bible down at home and I want you to open your Bible with me to the book of 2 Peter as we consider Peter's refutation of error. Peter refutes error and particularly in this epistle he refutes the error you and I know as once saved, always saved. Now here's what we're going to do. From all three of these chapters basically, we're going to be able to note three reasons why once saved, always saved is wrong. Once saved, always saved is found false in light of God's Word because of these three reasons brought out by Peter in this epistle. Reason number one. The first reason is because of the effort that is required. The effort that is required. Now consider this with me. Second Peter was written to children of God. It was written to those who had already obeyed the gospel of Christ and were thus already saved from their past sins. Now does it not stand to reason that if the doctrine of once saved, always saved were true, then there would be no further effort required on the part of these to whom Peter wrote. Absolutely that stands to reason. That would absolutely be the case. Once saved, always saved. These to whom Peter wrote were saved. Therefore there's no need, there's no requirement of any further effort on their part. That's logical. However, it is not scriptural. What we're going to see here from 2 Peter chapter 1 primarily is we're going to see that there was effort still required on the part of these to whom Peter wrote. Now many people are confused here and many people are fearful when you talk about human effort. They misunderstand and, and they misconstrue this to mean that man is not saved by grace. Friends, let me tell you, each one of us who is saved is certainly saved by grace. But by the same token, the Bible clearly teaches that salvation by grace does not preclude a responsibility on man's part. God, yes, is the one who has initiated man's salvation. God is the one who has made man's salvation possible. But man now, in turn, is the one who must respond accordingly to what God and Christ have done. There is responsibility. There is effort required, not only initially in first coming to Christ and in obeying the gospel, but as we're about to see, even thereafter. Even in continuing onward to live the Christian life, the remainder of one's days upon this earth. Look with me now to 2 Peter chapter 1 and let's begin reading at verse 3. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Notice verse 3 is talking about what God has done. God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, in other words. Read on, verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world, through lust. Again here in verse 4 we read about what God has done for us. Time and again we read about God's part in man's salvation. The most important part no doubt. The foundational part absolutely. God is the one who has given us these exceeding great and precious promises. 
God is the one who has made it possible for us to escape the corruption that is in this world through lust. But having read 2 Peter 1 verses 3 and 4, we now come to verse 5. And the wording of verse 5 is striking. It's important. Verse 5 that adds, And beside this... In other words, laying alongside all that God has done for us through Christ, verses 3 and 4, beside this, verse 5, giving all diligence. Now this is your part. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. And then he continues on in the following verses enumerating what we know commonly as the Christian graces. Now this is so important, friends. Peter is bringing out for us the fact that even though we have come to Christ as these had done, having come to Christ, there is still effort that is required. And that effort namely involves diligence. We must give all diligence, verse 5, in order to grow as children of God to cultivate these qualities of heart and life that you can read about in verses 5, 6, and 7. To maintain faithfulness before God in our everyday lives as you can read about throughout the balance of the New Testament. We are to give forth all diligence. There's effort. That word diligence supposes effort. It supposes, in fact, also urgency. One's putting forth that which is important, and they do so with fervor. They do so with all seriousness. Friends, we must do this. Now, if once saved, always saved were true, then we could just go on about our merry way, so to speak, and there wouldn't be any cause or any concern to be diligent to cultivate these Christian traits or characteristics. Oh, we've been once saved and we're always saved. Well, then why would Peter write what he's writing here in chapter 1? Move down with me to verse 8. 2 Peter 1 and verse 8, he goes further. He says, For if these things, these Christian graces, be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone who has read John chapter 15 knows the importance of not being unfruitful. There in John 15, as Jesus discussed the vine and the branches, He pointed out that those branches which do not bear fruit are pruned back. They're cut away, separated from the vine, and thrown into the fire. Now think about that. Obviously, these branches had been connected with Christ, indicative of salvation. They were in the vine, and yet they were unfruitful. They were essentially dead, in a sense, and so they're pruned away. They're cut away and thrown into the fire. Again, indicative here of damnation. Friends, once saved, always saved is patently false. Jesus implies that in John 15. Peter clearly brings this out here in 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 8, we're impressed with not being unfruitful. Move down to verse 10. 2 Peter 1 and verse 10. Wherefore the rather, instead of becoming unfruitful, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. How is it, Peter, that we can make our calling and election sure? By continued faithfulness? Yes. By the cultivation of these Christian graces in verses 5, 6, and 7? Yes. He says, For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. See, the Bible does not teach unconditional, once saved, always saved. That's Calvinism. That's a doctrine of men which we're presently pointing out. However, Peter tells us, if you don't want to fall, if you want to safeguard your salvation, there are things you can do. There is effort that you can exert. There is diligence. Here we read it again in verse 10. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. This word diligence 
again, it suggests for us the effort that is required. There's a verse in chapter 3 of this epistle that we need to notice presently. Turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. Here again, Peter mentions this diligence, this maximum effort that one would put forth because of the importance and because of the seriousness of the matter at hand, namely salvation, faithfulness before God. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 14, he adds, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent. Be diligent that you may be found of Him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Here the Bible is telling me and you, it's telling us to give effort. Put forth effort and work according to God's will. Do not work in your own way or concocting your own plan, but work the works of the Father and strive to be found in peace, to be peaceful. Strive to be found without spot and blameless. 2 Peter 3 and verse 14. Friends, let me say again and then we'll proceed. This doctrine of once saved, always saved is false. Peter refutes this error for us in the book 2 Peter because of the effort that is required. It is still required even of those who have been saved. But now number two. In the second place, once saved, always saved is patently false because of the entanglement that is possible. And Peter brings this out. It is possible for people to become entangled once more in sin. Now for this we go to chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And I want us to read first of all verses 17 through 19. 2 Peter 2 beginning at verse 17. Here Peter is describing some false teachers and not only false teachers but they're really immoral people as well. And in their own immorality, they appear to be persuading other children of God to go off into this immorality with them. And so they're false teachers not only in doctrine, but they're false teachers also in morals and by their own example. Read with me 2 Peter 2 and verse 17. Of these men, Peter writes, These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, they allure through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Now you need to underline that at the end of verse 18. Who are the ones that are imperiled? Who are the ones brought into jeopardy? Those that were clean escaped from them that live in error. These people were saved. These people were children of God. And yet these false teachers now are alluring them away through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Put with it verse 19. While they promised them liberty, all oh, the liberty and the freedom to do what you want and to live how you'd like, they themselves are the servants or the slaves of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. Isn't that ironic? In fact, some might describe it as the irony of all ironies. Those who are libertine in their thinking. That is, they say, look, true liberty, true freedom is living the way you want to live, doing what you want to do, not having restraints, not having guidelines. And yet Peter tells us here in verse 19 that of whom or by which a man is overcome, that very thing brings that man into bondage. Folks right here, Peter's having to write these things to his readers because he's warning them. He's telling them, look, these people, they speak with great swelling words of vanity, verse 18. They will allure you through the lust of the flesh. They want to pull you away from God. Now, some would try to allege, well, these people have never known God. Once you know God and come to God, you can't be pulled away. But verse 18 says differently. 
At the end of verse 18, this is involving those that were clean, escaped from them who live in error. Folks, there's no such thing as not being saved if you have clean escaped from those that live in error. What have you escaped from? If you're still guilty and if you're still lost, you haven't escaped anything. And so there's no doubt. Peter is telling us that entanglement is still possible. The child of God can wander. The child of God can stray and once again become entangled in the sins of this world. Now if it wasn't clear enough from 2 Peter 2 verses 17 through 19, let's just continue reading now from chapter 2 picking up at verse 20. For if after they have escaped, there's the word, they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That word knowledge there is epigenosis, a full and thorough knowledge. That These are people who know better. They have known the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but they are again entangled therein. And overcome, Peter says, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. They had known it. Then after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Let me pause just to say again, friends. Every word seemingly that Peter's using here indicates to us that a child of God can turn. A child of God can fall away and wonder and be lost. Now verse 22, But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. The sow that was washed has now gone back to the mud. Now that is a proverb. That is a graphic description of a child of God who has been saved, else he or she would not be a child of God. But now they've gone back. They've gone back and again, as we read in verse 20, have become entangled in the ways of this world. Friends, once saved, always saved is false. It is false because of the entanglement that is still possible even after conversion. You know, not only did Peter write to Christians and warn Christians of falling away, the possibility of doing it, but also Paul. Paul, when he wrote in Romans chapter 6, he was writing to the saints at Rome. He was writing to Christians children of God who had been saved. And in Romans 6, in verse 16, he told these saved persons, he said, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Why would he ever write such things to children of God if, if, it were impossible for them to fall away and to be lost. Friends, Paul knew what Peter knew. Both of them as inspired apostles knew that any doctrine such as once saved, always saved, would be false. It is untrue. But now number three, as our time is fleeting, there's yet a third reason we can find in the Scriptures, particularly from the book of 2 Peter, as to why once saved, always saved is refuted. And that is number three, because of the error that must be avoided. Not only is entanglement possible, but therefore error must be avoided. Let's notice this from chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. Peter says, But there were false prophets also among the people, namely the people of Israel of old. Even as there shall be, now get this, even as there shall be false teachers among you. <laughs> among whom? Among you, the children of God. 
There will be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Again, Peter is writing to saved People. He's writing to children of God and he's warning them of false teachers who would come in among them and who would seek to make merchandise of them. Why such a warning? Because error must be avoided. You can look also to chapter 3 and verse 17. Time will not permit us to read it. But in chapter 3 and verse 17, Peter brings this epistle to a close warning them not to be led away with the error of the wicked. Ladies and gentlemen, the Gospel Broadcasting Network has just brought you Preaching the Gospel with Brother Cliff Goodwin. If you have a question relative to anything that's been taught, or if you would like a CD or a tape of the message, just call the toll-free number on your screen. Be happy to send it to you. And by the way, if you would like to study the Bible privately in your own home, we offer free a set of five studies. And we'd be happy to send these to you at no cost at all. And it would be of great advantage. Study your Bible, learn the truth, and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will have to do with your eternal destiny. We appreciate, Cliff, the excellent job that he did in the presentation of truth. Take advantage of it. May God bless. Friend, did you tune in today as one who has previously believed the doctrine of once saved, always saved? If so, I'm so grateful that you took the time to follow along with me and to examine Peter's refutation of that error. You know, it's also possible that maybe you have been misled, maybe you have been deceived regarding other biblical matters. What about what one must do in order to be saved? I want to invite you very soon to visit with the Church of Christ in your local community. I trust that in so visiting you'll find a group of people who are warm and friendly and who are devoted only to practicing what the Bible says. You know, regarding salvation, it is imperative that you find the truth.